That, that was very British. God bless you. I ble but this is a British old garden. Ah, oh, the Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. And you know, it's, it's good with all the political fervor that surrounds Israel and Bible prophecy that um, I think we've always had this time away with the Lord alone and um, I think it was the most privileged pulpit I've ever had in my life to have been conducting the Sunday morning service here for seven years and I had the people sit um, below the Jerusalem pines with the birds chirping away and uh, even if the message was not uh, 100 uh, percent the empty tomb made up for it because what can you say in front of the empty tomb. I usually stood there and um, at the uh, sunrise service we made that the um, pulpit and the garden on Easter sunrise was full of people and as Richard the director already said um, we are so thankful this is still the garden it was in the garden that Mary stood weeping and she thought it was the gardener of the garden instead of the Lord but when he called her by name because he knows Tuna by name and uh, then she, re she realized no one calls me like that, but the Lord. And she said, Rabuni. Um, the, the, the Jews don't know that yet, but uh, they have at the moment a prime minister. But if they want, they can have a king because the king is still alive, the son of David. But they also have a chief rabbi. And the chief rabbi is the one that you love, who said that no one call you rabbi for one is your rabbi and that's what she said Rabuni um, my master and um, I don't think there are many Christians if you would ask them says who is the chief rabbi of Israel would know that they are carrying the chief rabbi of Israel right within them and um, we'll we'll later go into the empty tomb and I sometimes said to the people when I took them around here and I took thousands around. I said, he is not here. He is risen. But you smuggled him in through the custom officials <laughs> when you came. And you're much more, no? You're much more a holy place mm -hmm. than any of the holy places. Amen, yeah. For the one that is not there yes. went up and through his Holy Spirit. Yes. Christ yes. in you. The hope of glory. And that was the central part of the Pauline letters. 153 times he says, En Christoi, Christ Jesus in you. So you took, um, you took him in. I was privileged because my father was private secretary to the Queen of Holland, Juliana. And um, I pushed her a bit to come to Israel. And, um, when she came here, because it was a whole, as the bridges say, kafafo, the, 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 she was then queen mother, she had already given it over to Beatrix, and I took her around, and um, I knew she loved us, because she often had dinner with us in our home, because she loved my mother, and um, then I, I felt when I brought her to the tomb to leave her alone and uh, because she also is a human being from whom the Lord has died and um, then she became 17 and I wrote her I said you're becoming a bit older but you've been to the empty tomb in the garden tomb and you know that Death does not need to be the end. And she wrote me with her own hand back. She said, from all the birthday posts I received, you were the only one 
that talked about eternal life. And therefore, I want to answer you. Sweet. And sometimes we don't speak the truth at the moment that we can. We are flippant and we say, oh, hello, how are you? Happy birthday to you. And so I remember we were invited to the palace to, um, for the birthday of the princess. It was a very wonderful believer. If I show the letters I got from her, the press would love to eat it up. And she began to say, praise the Lord. And they went with, in the revival we had in those days with their bikes through the city of Suzdaik and I heard them sing, the young people, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> and my father, as private secretary, says, oh, I hope the press never gets behind this. So um, we were invited at the palace to come in. And you can all feel this. You feel sort of important. You're, we're still human beings. Invited to the princess palace. And so I met different one of the young people, some of them involved with the revival that we've had. And I saw a young nobleman and I said, Hello, Enes, how are you? Oh, fine. And then the Lord spoke. You're performing. You're not interested in him. You're just so happy that you're one of the guests. And so I put him back. I said, how are you really? Yeah. You know, we can be so flippant. As sons and daughters of God, that we say he is in us and not in the tomb. But then it's us who talks. And I'm more and more, as I have lived, convinced of the verse, if any man speak, let it be the words of God. And you will have far less flippant talk. If you bring yourself in the influences, the, did the Lord tell you to tell that, say that about that person or that person? Or even about yourself? Or are you waiting? Have you learned to wait for the one who is in you to speak? And if he doesn't speak, you shut up. So I went back to this man and I said, um, How are you really? Does he want to know? This week I wanted to commit suicide, I had my gun on my head. And I thought, Lord, he was stand in the palace. And people are hurting everywhere. And I remember a man who was in that, and I said, look. It was close physically to the palace. I cannot bring you to the Lord. <laughs> I can talk to you, but in the end, it's you who have to open up. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up. And he went, he went on his knees with me. And he went to pray. And even after that, there is, of course, a battle for all of us. But that's why it is so good to be here and to realize that we are the most miserable men of all men, the Bible says. If Jesus was not risen. I got a letter of a man who says, you, you're pitiful. And in a way, and he thought that I was going to say, I'm not pitiful, I don't believe it. I said, you're right. We are the most pitiful people from all men. If Christ was not risen, because you have the most difficult road. Today, everyone does what he wants, has a fine life, switches partners, goes to bed, and they want. And it's getting more and more, and it's infiltrating the church. And you, if you really want to walk the narrow, we can all make our mistakes and sins, but I hope for, 
Let me turn back to the Lord, but if you want to go on the narrow road, you have a hard time. I remember when I was, we say catechism, when I was in the Dutch Reformed Church, you know, getting ready. No, I didn't become a Dutch Reformed, but uh, the son of the pastor, he said to me, you will, I'm the only one in the class that never has gone to bed with a girl. I, I begin to feel, it was not just because he wanted to do it, he says, I'm in need with you. They said, well, you know. There is such thickness coming in to the church that the most miserable people will be the Christians because they have to keep the narrow road and people say, wow, I don't want to be alive. And let's be honest, we don't say that to the people. We begin to say, if you believe, you can be prosperous and the Lord's come to bless you. And all the preaching, 80% is about, He will heal you here and He will bless you here. No! Bible says God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not be happy in this that that's not the point but should not perish but have everlasting life many Jesus said shall try to enter through the narrow gate and not be able and few and you see it happen all over the bible says there will be a great falling away mm. of most christians before the lord comes back and you see it all over there mm. and we try to accommodate we sometimes try to copy the, the the beat of the world i don't want to copy the beat of the world i want to help ask the lord and his holy spirit he was holy let him be holy still and he who is filthy let him be filthy still and that happens on television in Holland, we have a woman say, I've had sex with my dog, it was one. It's a Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's become sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. Yeah. The filthy will be filthier still. And most Christians are trying to be a little bit in between. Let's be honest. So God has told us that there is a way back to paradise. Now, Listen to me. This was the center of paradise. Wow. You know how I know? From the Bible. And you know what it says in the Bible? That the paradise was bordered by four rivers. The Pison, the Gihon, the Hikadel, and the Euphrates. Now, the Gihon may have been the Nile, and the Euphrates, you know where that is. So the middle part between the Nile and Euphrates, you come here. So the middle part of the garden was here. And I sometimes have thought, Lord, this is amazing. Because there were two trees in the garden, there were many trees, fruit trees. But there were two main trees, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. And we took from the tree of knowledge and left the tree of life. And the first Adam sinned and took from the tree of knowledge. And the second Adam was crucified in the same place where the tree of life may have stood. And there's an old tradition in the old city that Adam's skull was buried there. Later, Noah built the ark in the valley of Jordan and then it was taken up and it ended in Ararat in Turkey. But can you imagine something? That the Lord who had to drive them out to the east always wanted to come back to the garden and then he tapped Abraham. Abraham, I want to bring you to a... He didn't say that was the paradise. I want to bring you to a land that I want to show you. <coughs> and I remember I was asked for the ABC to speak on a worldwide program. It was a, an amazing opportunity. They had 24 hours with Peter Jennings in New York. And as the sun came down over the 
third century, or what is it, third millennium, 2000, the year 2000, they were in New Zealand and they came closer and closer, and then I think they were in Rome, and then Peter Jennings says, we're now coming to the Holy Land, and, and uh, I was standing there, I was the spokesman for Jerusalem on the worldwide program of the ABC, so I was standing there, uh, hoping and praying that the Lord would help me to say it right, and I had a message. But they wanted typical political, they wanted to also be nice to the Palestinians, so they said we cannot only have Jerusalem for, I for Israel, we have to have Bethlehem for the Palestinians, and Arafat had just gotten Bethlehem, so they first went to Bethlehem, and <laughs> sorry, they, they wanted to do their peace game, uh, and, and peace spiel, uh, so they had white doves, 12 o'clock at night, and they wanted to push them up and say we are for peace in, in, the, in the year 2000 they are very much for peace and, and, and they wanted to bring these doves but doves don't fly in the night <laughs> so they couldn't get them to fly and then they had to put them uh, other little uh, uh, you know f fireworks like you have on the <laughs> and it, it, it became a whole it became, it became a whole thing but just now imagine what political correctness does. This was a program of 24. It went from city to city and it ended probably in Los Angeles. And I stood there. I thought, Lord, I can tell the whole world. And the Lord had given me a message. Jerusalem will dominate the news media in the third millennium as we enter it in. For it was the place where God began with man through the first Adam. Where God redeemed the man through the second Adam. And where the Lord is going to come back, not to Rome, not to again Jerusalem. So three times it was the beginning of God's way with, with mankind. I mean, a fantastic message. And so I was standing there while the Palestinians was trying to get their doves up. And, and the producer, he said, Mr. Vandu, you're not going to believe this. I can't cry even now. They're going to cut out Jerusalem. There's no more time. Mm. Bethlehem has taken, the Palestinian Bethlehem. It took so long, they're going to cut, I, and my wife and I, we felt later, oh Lord, this is terrible. Maybe you should have prayed me. And we understood how the devil fights. Even such, I was, in a way, like a child. I had the opportunity to tell the whole world at the beginning of the third millennium the significance of Jerusalem, that God created the first Adam year from this soil. He came back with the second Adam on the tree of life that we missed and says, you want the eternal life, you can have it. And they cut Jerusalem out. That's what political correctness does. I feel even as I speak it that the Lord says that is. It cuts out God, His city, and His people. So, uh, Alan and I, my wife, we said, Lord, we didn't pray enough. We had not enough prayer. But you have to pray for us. It is not going to happen just because we read the Bible says it says so and we have a little prophecy here and a little prophecy there. We have to put our lives behind it. The Jews could have sang choruses all over the west, the east bank of the Jordan and said, the Lord is faithful, the Lord is faithful. Who's going to be the speaker next week? Oh, we have a wonderful speaker. And so the next day they still are there at the Jordan overlooking Jericho. Oh, let's have another chorus. Wonderful. And claim the Lord's promise. And claim, hallelujah, we don't need to work it out. In fact, the Lord is going to do it. He's bringing the Jews back to the land. Let the swing again. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker. Wonderful. Call. When I see what the Israelis or the Israelites had to do to get the land that God promised under oath, I said, Lord, with permission. That's a very strange way of giving you land. They had to fight for every meter of it. And you said you were going to give it to them. Have you seen the battle? 
They had to go seven times or 13 times around Jerusalem. They had to fight. In other words, if you hear a word from the scripture, you have to put yourself so much behind it in, in, in any way that the Holy Spirit inspires you to do. For otherwise, my son is a prince, really. And he said once to me, he walks with the Lord, I love him. He says, Daddy, most Christians use their prayers to escape to do anything about what they pray for. It's so nice. We had a terrible division in the embassy at my time, and I had many people come to me. Oh, young man, we are praying for it, that it will be reconciled. Year after year, oh, we are praying. I said, oh, my goodness, the Lord must be dead. It's so easy just to pray because then you don't need to take sides. Because you're just praying and you can be nice to everybody. <laughs> and so I began to say, it began to irritate me. I said, the Bible doesn't say blessed are the peace prayers, but blessed are the peacemakers. And that is very painful if you want, because then you have to choose with God. So don't say, I believe all the prophecies I've written. I've read the books of Helens or whoever. That's not enough. If the Jews who believed the oath promise of God, I will give you the land overflowing from milk, had only sung choruses and claimed the promises, they would never have conquered the land. I want to conquer the land. I want to conquer that temple mount. And I tell you something, when I was in the garden here, I didn't think of saying this. I prayed and fasted some with two American brothers about the Feast of Tabernacles and it was born then in our hearts. And already then I said, I believe one day, I prayed about this now in the temple, one day the Feast of Tabernacles will end with a crescendo of praise on the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. The very things that the devil and the devil I, I will in eternity with an eternal, nice looking body. So, some of your ladies, you get a little bit gray and not so nice. Don't worry, because you get your best body yet. <laughs> yes. And I remember my son, he heard me speak, I don't know how many times, he, he sat sometimes in the graniums and he listened to his father. And then, and then in the morning, when he was still young, he said, oh Lord, I heard him pray in the morning prayer, Lord, thank you, we'll be zooming through the skies with astronautical bodies. Because he heard me say, we will get astronautical bodies, we can take over, oh. go to the planets and sail through the and have unbelievable music and we'll see two the hey have a good time fantastic pleasures forevermore are at his right hand and i want that because i know how much my sisters and brothers on this narrow road have to deny themselves and cut into their flesh as we're all by god's graces so i'm so happy that we may be the most miserable man in comparison to the freedom of the swinging world. But one day, it's your day. Blessed are you when you weep now, for you shall laugh. And you're going to have a nice body. You know, I remember taking Dr. Christian Barnard, the, the first heart transplant, mm -hmm. and he came from the Grote Schuur Hospital in Cape Town. Some of you. South Africans know more about it than you. So he came as his second wife. And uh, I have them in my hand <laughs> when they're here. So I took them first to Calvary and then to the tomb. And uh, I think I prayed with them. But then I thought, my, this man is world famous. World famous. Why? Because he through a heart transplant gives men five, six more years to their lollipop suck and then they die with a second heart. So five more years and that is so important for people. Oh, Dr. Christian, and we go have a, oh, oh, ten more years. And then we go. And then I thought, wow, Lord, 
if he is famous, I should be more famous. Because I stand here, now listen, I stand here at the tomb and I offer persons who believe and repent, not a heart transplant, but a body transplant. I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you shall never die. We believe, according to the Apostolic Creed, I don't know if they have the Reformed and the Orthodox and the Catholics, they all end the Apostolic Creed. And I believe in the resurrection of the body. I said, wait! What did you say? A soul with a hymn book swooning around in heaven? My soul is saved. And my soul will be in heaven. No. You will come up with a new body in the paradise of God as he wanted it always and enjoy his presence and pleasures for what though I has seen and I've seen a lot and what no heart has conceived and I can conceive a lot Betty too And what no ear has heard. He hears every word I say there in heaven. God has prepared for those that love him. So very nice. Well, for us it is still the Holy Sepulchre. But if the people want to know how it looked like in the time of Jesus, they should go to the garden too. <laughs> And they'll go quickly back to the Holy Sepulchre and close their eyes and say, it looked as I saw in the garden tomb, but it happened here. <laughs> well, I can live with that. <laughs> so an Israeli said to me, I think it was an Israeli, the Christians say, heaven is wonderful. But they do everything to stay on the earth. <laughs> so it must not be so wonderful. You know, so when somebody dies of cancer, sorry, in cancer, so, oh, look. And we all, we, we get people praying and praying. There's so little emphasis on the real reason why the Lord sent the gospel. And that brings me to the end. If the scientists had our message, they would need only 10 years to bring it to the last creatures on earth. And what is our mess? Can you imagine the scientists finding a tablet that is so powerful that when somebody dies of a car accident, he gets from a loved one, that he, he lays there, he gets this powerful tablet and it comes into him and, <laughs> and he stands up with a body that will never die. Can you imagine the headings of the, the paper? Enormous breakthrough. Scientists find physical eternal life. Get this tablet to the people dying of hunger in Madras, in India, and in the Amazon. Where? Oh, and, and World Health Organization will be distributing it. And we have the message for 2,000 years. We're not any more excited about the eternal life and body we get. And we're getting all involved with this life that the Lord becomes the servant of us here to heal us, to help us. And, uh... and the, the reason for the Bible, I'm not against healing. The reason why he called you is because he loved you so much that he cannot think of eternity without you being eternally with him. That's how, how much he loves us. So, I end. There are many institutions in the world. Medical institution, university. I was so happy. I was seven years here preaching all this. Well, not all this. You got an extra. But I never had a rival. I had never a person, when I finished speaking, says, Mr. Van der Hoeven, uh, I'm sorry uh, to disappoint you, but uh, there's an empty tomb in Tokyo. Did you know that? 
Mohammed did not leave an empty tomb, Buddha did not. I never, never had anyone who says, neither did I have a professor who say, um, Mr. Van der Hoeven, you speak about eternal life, but you don't, you know that the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, after years of research, have found a tablet to give people after they die a, a, a normal body back for eternity. You, you know that. I never had, no rifle. My son, no, my brother was a very, oh, is a very good doctor, and he helps people to 70 or 80. My other brother is a wonderful insurance man, help people to cover their risks. But where they, they end, I begin. <laughs> so I've never been jealous of them. And I've said to people who preach, Pastors, oh, I wish I could just take the bullets. I said, I said, get to understand that no one has your message, no scientist, no religion, and you sit and wobble around when you should be proud enough in your God that what in no institution in the world, no medical center, people have been able to find. You, the church, if it is the right location, I mean the right channel, the church is the only place where men can hear and find back the eternal life he lost in paradise. Whew. For me to live is Christ and what this Paul says, it's, it's much better for me. It was much better for me to go to the Lord. But for you, it, it may be better to stay a little bit. That's why I want some of you to stay. But it's much better.